All right. Hey, first of all, thanks a lot for coming on here. Like we were just kind of talking about before we hit record, it's been at least a decade since we've run into each other down at Herbie. Um, but uh, before that, I'm not sure when it was. But yeah, you and I spent uh, some time together at Benning and uh, and then again during our Herbert field time. So it's good to see you. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, great to see you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So let's just dig right in. Um, what we usually do is just kind of go chronologically and everybody kind of tells us how they how their childhood was and how it prompted them to get in the military and then we just kind of go on from there no oh this would be interesting <laughs> right hopefully <laughs> this yeah would be very this would be very interesting yeah so uh um grew up uh, rather on the lower end of the middle class my dad was a um a union member blue collar worker in cincinnati uh he did glazing uh he was drafted during vietnam but he did not go to vietnam he was spent all of his time in uh, korea on the dmz as a Nike Herc uh, missile scope dope. Wow. And uh, had some interesting uh, experiences from that. Um, but because he was drafted, you know, it was a very anti military uh, mindset in the household growing up. Yeah. So, and I remember him having uniforms and stuff in the attic. And you know, like I'd go up there and like pull all the shit out of his bags and, you know, look at it, try it on, this, that, and the other. And it was like, oh, this is so interesting. This is so cool. But, he would not really say too much about his experiences other than a couple of the highlights when he was around his friends of like the weird shit that he saw, like, Oh, I, I believe in aliens because I seen him on the scope, you know, <laughs> in a spacecraft or whatever. It was probably North Korean MIGs, but sure. anyway, <laughs> um, but you know, there's, a, there's a lot of, I guess, animosity that was built um, with that experience from him. Yeah. So when, and Fast forwarding, I guess, through my uh, childhood, um, me and my friends and scouts, we would go to the surplus store and buy all kinds of surplus uniforms and whatnot and, you know, go out and play war or whatever. Right. And then it was great. It was like, oh, this is awesome. This is what I want to do. Um, so when I was in high school in 1991, when the uh, ground war kicked off, when Saddam Hussein decided, you know what, I'm going to expand my sphere of influence <laughs> and... He decided, oh, yeah, I'm going to take over Kuwait. And I watched that shit unfold, you know, yeah. as a senior in high school. And I'm like, wow, we just went in there and decimated that shit. Right. I want to be part of that. <laughs> I'm going to be part of that. So yeah. I enlisted in the Army. Um, but I did signal. And then my first duty station was Korea, <laughs> not the Middle East. <laughs> So yeah, it was a uh, it was an interesting it was an interesting experience, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me about that. Like, how, you, so you were in Korea in the like early '90s, which I was there in the mid '90s. So it was bananas. Uh, was it? Did you have a similar experience with it being kind of off the hook? Uh, I mean, Korea itself was off the hook. Yeah. I mean, the it was it was it was an experience. It was my first time being away from home. All right. But as I found out when I was there. Okay, I knew my dad was in Korea, but he was up on the DMZ, and I found out while I was in Korea when I was sending letters back and forth home and this that and the other. My uh, my dad's uncle, I guess my great uncle, he was in Korea during the Korean War. Oh, okay, so it was like almost like a third generation, if you will, of okay. being on the on the peninsula serving in that country. So it was kind of cool. Um, and then really, it was. I was in Busan, or Busan, they call it now. Yeah. Um, Camp Hialeah was bulldozed over like, what, 10, 12 years ago? Uh, it's now a park. Anyway, um, I was a signal station. It was a signal relay station for the 1st Signal Corps, or 1st Signal Brigade. Anyway, um, so it was fixed station comm relay site. Okay. It was really nothing. It was mundane. Yeah. Uh, a lot of partying and this, that, and the other, but it wasn't really... It wasn't really my great awakening. That would come later on, much, right, right. much later on, <laughs> actually, when I was up there with you guys. Okay. <laughs> um, and then from there, it was, I got my orders for my next duty station, which was Fort Campbell, Kentucky with the Special Force Group. I was going to 3rd Battalion uh, Support Company. Nice. I was going to be on their signal thing. So that was actually really cool. That was really interesting. So here I am, a young private first class showing up and... I checked in and the, the guy who was a, he was an E6 and he's like looking at everybody else in the shop. And he's like, we got a private. I don't even know what to do with a private. What, <laughs> right. what do we do with, I've never seen a private in like forever. And yeah, like, yeah. I'm like intimidated. Like here's a bunch of green berets. They're all echoes. Yeah. And I'm like, 
uh, oh shit, they're going to kill me. They're going to eat me. <laughs> you know, it's like, right, right. I mean, they b- really brought me in. And there was a couple of them that, you know, like, hey, what do you want to do with your career? What do you want to do with your life? And I, that's when I started realizing that, you know, all these guys, they didn't start off their lives, their careers as snake eaters, you know, right. Green Berets. They started off as like a cook or a mechanic or, you know, a personnel clerk or whatever else. And then they, as they progressed, they decided to do something more. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. Yeah. Um, and then I went through airborne school. Well, actually, I went to air assault school, graduated three days later, found myself in airborne school. Yeah, I read that. Like, what, what was the deal? They just had, was it, was it by design or was it like, well, we just have a slot, so get going, you know, you're going yeah. again or, okay. Yeah. And <laughs> God, it was, it was so messed up because I remember at the, the first formation for early in the morning uh, for airborne school, that was an alpha company. And everybody's, they, the, the black hats are out there yelling at everybody. It's like, when we call attention, you know, you're going to yell at airborne. And I had it already programmed in my mind, oh my in my God. head, <laughs> to yell air assault. Because right, I just right. graduated from that school. So <laughs> everybody, they called attention and everybody's yelling airborne. And I yell out, air assault. And it was like silence. Yeah. And the black hats are running back and forth like freaking wasps like who said that who said that and i'm sitting there sweating like oh my god they're gonna kill me <laughs> i grabbed my air assault wings and ripped them off and hit them in my pocket like they're gonna kill me i don't want to do push-ups all right but i mean it was it was a great experience um and then from there it was i had a sit-down discussion with uh, my ncoic at the shop and he's like hey you need to figure out what you want to do with your life you know we well, yeah, my life, but what you want to do with your career. Yeah. Um, do you want to continue on re-enlist or what? And I'm like, no, I want to go and get my degree. I want to move on. I want to become something. I'm not really sure what that something is, but I want to progress. Right. So at that point, I decided that I'm going to get out of the active duty. I'm going to go into the guard and I'm going to pursue my, my degree. I didn't know what that was. But I'm going to school. I'm going to college. So I got into the Ohio National Guard, and uh, that was a shit show. But um, yeah, I mean, then I started going to school full time. Yeah. So where'd you go to school? Uh, University of Cincinnati. Okay. Nice. They play. Uh, they play uh, University of Central, Flor- Central Florida today. Oh, okay. In a little bit. So I'm going to be hopefully watching that game, depending on what the little puppy does. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so aside from that, um, I. Uh, Worked my way up through the National Guard doing the National Guard one weekend a month and two weeks in the summer kind of thing. And it was really mundane until, uh, I guess it was 90, it was 96. Then they offered a position. Um, It was a deployment. And this is when the whole uh, Serbia, Kosovo, uh, Bosnia thing was going on. Right. And they had, they had a call out for, hey, we got a unit that's getting ready to deploy. And do we have any volunteers? And I'm like, yeah, I'll volunteer. And they're like, well, it's a movement control team, you know, which is essentially they just do border clearance, orders, dip clearances, if you will, kind of like that. But it's like, you know, on the ground. Okay. Um, and then just working with the customs officials, et cetera. And I'm like, well, I'm a combo guy what do i do and they're like oh yeah we have a position we'll make it we'll make it go so i was on the seven man team and we found ourselves in hungary for nine months um 1996 and 1997 and that was just a rip roaring drunk fest i was gonna say (laughs) it was wow yeah uh lots of beans and bullets and yeah it was i mean it was great it was it was awesome i spent two weeks in budapest man it was awesome it was two straight weeks and it was all paid for. And I was like, yes, because I was like on this, uh, they would rotate people out to control for the, uh, MWR. Um, they were pulling people out of the whole Bosnia thing for like a small period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Stay up there just like for R and R. Also one of the control guys, it was like, okay, we got 10 people that are getting off the bus in three days. We got 10 people that are getting back on the bus. Yeah, it was, it was great. Yeah. Um, beautiful city lots of history there yeah um but we, yeah we did some great stuff there um beyond that it was really i needed to buckle down and get to school get back home or get to school and all that kind of stuff and continue on with things um and then it was that spring when we got back in 97 um i'd gone through 
that, that was called PLDC then, but now it's BLC. Uh, yeah. It was the basic leadership course for NCOs because I was an E4 specialist. So I went on to, I went to that course and then I found a position for E5 because in the National Guard, unlike active duty, you have to find a position to get promoted. Right. It's not like, oh, you meet all the criteria and you met the board and you get promoted. No, you have to sit there and wait for somebody to die or somebody to retire or get out in order right. to fill that position. So I found a position. It was in an armor unit. So I took that position. And then right about the same time, um, one of the people that I was with at my old unit that I was leaving, they were active duty. It was called active duty special work, ADSW. And they were working with an Ohio National Guard counter drug task force program, okay. which they support uh, local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies with counter drug efforts in the state because you're it's the whole division between title 10 and title 32 status so sure, we're title sure. 32 status we could do a lot of things within the state of ohio that a title 10 military person would not be able to do especially when you're going against american citizens right um you know with collection that kind of stuff when it comes to yeah. legalities so i got on this program and i was working for the fbi in downtown cincinnati on this counter drug task force, which was a multi agency task force with the county, state, and other agencies like the ATF, uh, the Treasury, and the federal marshals, all that kind of stuff. So it was really cool. And yeah. I was a, all I was doing was taking all this information from cell phones from the phone companies and doing a spider chart. You know, hey, this, this person's talking to this person down here, and this person talking to this person up here. And, this person appears as grandma. He calls his grandma every other day. And this person down here, yeah, that person's no good. Mm -hmm, so okay. it, was, it was this whole connection thing. Wow. Um, which was great. And it that would come up later. Yeah. Um, so I did that and I was finishing my degree. I was graduating with uh, a, degree, a degree in criminal justice and minored in computer science, which just kind of dovetailed into everything that I was doing with the FBI. But I wanted to become a park ranger because I love the outdoors. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to be a park ranger. So one of the FBI agents sat down with me and he's like, yeah, we're going to talk about this. And they got me in contact with a, uh, a U.S. National Park force ranger. Mm -hmm. And that's when it was broken to me that the only way you're going to get one of those positions, much like a guard position for promotion, is somebody dies, <laughs> somebody retires, or somebody decides to you know quit. And yeah. it was like, oh, crap. And there's, so, there's even fewer positions. So I'm like, oh, crap. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I got my degree. And then my boss, um, who was in charge of all of us at the, uh, in the National Guard, was like, hey, we're going to have a funding shortfall coming up, and we need to find people that are willing to leave mm. and it's not based on anything other than who was the first person in the program they're protected so the last person on board was is the first person to go and i'm like oh, all right i'm volunteering i'm gonna go and chase my because i was i was looking at getting married at the time and i'm gonna go ahead and chase a commission because sure. I, I was already an nco I'm going to chase my commission and I put my package in with all the, all four branches. And the only one that was talking to me every day was the air force guy. Um, so I decided that I'm going to get married, got married on the uh, 15th of June in 2001 and 28 September, 2000 or yeah, 28 September, 2001 was my last day in the army. 29 September was my first day in the air force. Oh, okay. When I checked into OTS, it was right after 9-11. I was going to say, what a time to like go through all that transition yeah. stuff. Yeah. I, like as I was turning my kit, like my TA-50 to the supply guy <laughs> and I had showed up at the armory and had all my paperwork signed and everything was approved. And there's like the full-time guard guys that are at the armory right. there in Cincinnati. And they're like, yeah, we well, they had this weird accident that just happened in New York City. A plane just crashed into one of the towers. I'm like, I was just there for my honeymoon. And yeah, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. So I'm turning all the stuff in. And then as I'm leaving, every, everybody's huddled around the TV. And all of a sudden, you see the second plane come in. And I'm like, oh, shit. That wasn't an accident. Yeah. And then the, the S3 guy upstairs comes down. He's like, you're not going anywhere. And I'm like, screw you. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not in the guard. I'm going active duty. I'm not running away from the fight. I'm going to the fight. Right, exactly. So, And it was kind of like, you know, this whole unknown of, oh, shit. You know, this thing just got real. Yeah. 
So then I went through OTS, um, went to Randolph uh, for NAV school. I was rated as a navigator um, in electronic warfare and then found my first duty station at 4th Special Operations Squadron in Herbert Field, uh, the AC-130 U-model gunships as an nice. electronic, electronic warfare officer. Yeah, it was m- like shitloads of deployments and yeah, it was busy. It was yeah. really busy. Um, Can you talk to those at all? I, 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 oh, I mean, yeah. I haven't really heard anything uh, like from the air, you know what I mean? Like we have a ton of ground guys on here and you'll go into that, your ground piece later. But yeah, I'm just interested to hear, you know, especially from a gunship perspective, because they were like very prevalent. Like we really used right. a lot of those guys a lot, especially like in the very initial push. I don't know if were you through your training when we went over there in October or had you, were you still kind of in getting settled in? I got, I got to my, um, I got to Hurlburt in, that was January of 02. Okay. When I got there. So I started my, um, my mission qual, if you will, yeah, on yeah. the platform at the, at the training unit there on Hurlburt, 19th SOS. Um, and I graduated October, October, November timeframe. I think it was October. Cause it was like, as soon as I graduated, um, I got my Q1 graduated, um, and was in the unit, I deployed almost immediately. Yeah. So I was over there and it was quiet. It was, it was like from that October deployment, it was mid October when we got there, uh, it was quiet and I was on this crew. Um, it was our, our commander, our aircraft commander was Ari Bender and, uh, every, all the other crews that were there. Cause we're launching out of Ali al Salim mm. and going into our, uh, from Kuwait into Iraq. And we didn't really have anything going on nothing and then one night it was a, there was an armor unit it was in bakaba uh which is north and west no correction north and east of baghdad if i'm not mistaken and then they got a call that like they're getting sniped so we're just we check in overhead and i'm like the the electronic warfare officer right so i'm defense of the air crew there's 13 crew members i feel like i'm the odd man out because i'm defending the aircraft and they're all fangs out ready to sure, kill sure. people you know that's that's it's that's the division of labor if you will it's yeah, like yeah. i have to make sure that everybody everybody's safe and we we arrive home where everybody else is uh we're gonna you know do all the the damage so you right know, all the crew members doing stuff but the real job that I had because there wasn't really a, uh, cause it was so permissive in that uh, during that time right. was a glorified radio operator. That's oh, okay. all I did. I was like, I'm in charge of SATCOM. I'm in charge of HPW. I got all the crypto. So it's like, wait a minute. This is, I was a, I'm a combo guy all over again. Yeah, you know, yeah, just, yeah. Like I, just like I did in the army. What the right. hell? <laughs> Getting paid a little bit more, but this, this, this sucks, Yeah, but this is cool. Um, but we checked in that one night and, um, I remember the one sensor operator that we had, uh, Marty Van Buren, uh, a great guy. Through their sensors, they were able to see tracer fire from the two armor, uh, our armor guys on the ground. So they did a, uh, they just followed the tracers to a certain point. And we just stared at that area for, I don't know, like, it seems like forever. Yeah. But it, it, it probably only like three or four minutes. All right. And finally they said, yeah, we got somebody in, they're in defilade. So it was like these, it was like a, uh, I don't know, just some kind of tree farm or whatever. So they had like these canals of water Yep. that were going in like a parallel formation or, or whatever. And these guys were down in there. There's three guys. And they're like, we got them. And then we called down and uh, the, the navigator on the aircraft is the one that's in charge of all the communications with the aircraft to the ground. Mm. Um, communications from the aircraft back to home station and everybody else that's not in the air. Gotcha. Um, and then we, we found them and we got permissions immediately. So we fired 12 rounds on those dudes, three guys. And it was that moment really set, set in because it was like the very first time that I'm seeing it right there. Yeah. So they, all the crew was in there cheering because they got what they call a torso toss. I mean, literally a one of five round hit that guy right in the center, right? I guess in the pelvic area. Oh. And you could see, you could see as the explosion went up, just the top half of them just kind of uplifting into the air and flying down and i'm just like looking at this on the screen right there in front of me with this it kind of like nvgs but it's a they call it 12 color grayscale screen or green screen or whatever so 
I'm looking at it like almost horrified, but everybody else is like, yeah, yeah, get some. Right. You hear the gunner, you hear the gunners in the background yelling, gun ready. And it's like, oh shit, this is, this is happening. This, this has happened. I'm watching it unfold. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was a lot to take in, sure. um, you know, from that experience, it was like, wow, this is, this is profound. And then from that moment on things started picking up. It was because it was like two months of no shooting, no nothing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we're in it and they have other units that are calling in. Um, but that was a, that was a crazy deployment um, for me anyway. Cause it was like, Oh shit, this is what we're doing. Okay, right. We're doing this. <laughs> we're killing people. Yeah. But it was, you know, it was, as and it had know, to be like like night and day from what you're used to. Like you know, you had the army background. You're a combo dude. You're on the ground, and now you're like in the air. Just it, it couldn't. It had to be surreal. It, it was very surreal because yeah. it was like instantly we could see what we were doing, what impacts we had. Right. You know, because the ground guys are calling for everything. You know, you have your five line call for fire. They're calling for all the stuff, and we're immediately delivering it. Yeah. And so we're seeing it and then we're, Hey, yeah, rounds are good, you know, or, you know, we're, we're tweaking right now or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, when we call the JTAC on the ground or whoever's, or the FSO or the FO if in, in some cases, sure. And we're just calling and say, Hey, yeah, you know, this, this is your BDA. This is where rounds complete. You know, when we met your intent, what's the next tasking? Yeah. In a so. permissive environment, there's nothing better than a gunship. I mean, I, I love helicopters, love A-10s, love all that stuff. But if, if you're, if, like I said, if it's permissive and they're having a gunship just circle overhead, just, I mean, the sensors, just the capabilities of the platform is phenomenal. You know, just amazing. Yeah. And everything an you want. Anything you want. Yeah. Yeah. And it just delivers everything, you know. Yeah. And and follow-on deployments. Um, I, have, I actually did one deployment where they did a floor load of ammunition. So this is back when or the U model gunship for anybody that wants to Google it, we had three guns. We had gun one, gun two, gun three. Gun one was the GAL 12 equalizer, the 25 millimeter Gatlin gun. Gun two was the 40 Mike Mike Bofors cannon, which was actually, yeah, it was derived from pre World War II uh, anti-aircraft artillery, but the guns that we actually used on the aircraft were from, Army, um, was it M42 Dusters? Uh, some kind of tracked vehicle that had two guns, two 40 millimeter guns on it. Oh, no kidding. I didn't know that. And it was only one gun because the guns were mirrored. You had a left gun and a right gun, and they were actually mirror, uh, mirror images of each other. Okay. So it was just one of the guns. I don't remember which one. And they had the 105, which was a M102 Army field howitzer. Um, right. But the rounds were specialized for all three guns. So we would floor load ammunition, and that was for the 40 millimeter. So we carried 256 rounds of 40 Mike Mike, but you, we could floor load additional cans of about 100 rounds in these big steel cans. And one mission, and I think it was when we were supporting the Fallujah or Fallujah 2 mm -hmm. for the Marines, it was it was not unheard of for gunships to Winchester. Really? On that shit. And it was just like... Holy shit! You have a hundred rounds of one hundred five, two hundred and fifty six rounds of forty Mike Mike, and three thousand rounds of twenty five Mike Mike, and you're coming back empty. Yeah, and it's just unleashing, you know, every bit of hate that you could possibly think on the enemy down below. Yeah, and it was, I mean, it was devastating for the for the enemy. I'm sure. Oh yeah, it had to been, and I know that uh, there were discussions at some point while I was at the fourth SOS. Um, that somebody wanted to pull the 25 millimeter gun off of the aircraft. And it was the through us. SOCOM, the army came back and said, no, yeah, you're not going to do that. You're, you're going to keep what you have because, and then they had this report of some insurgent that they had in an interrogation one night and they're trying to get information out of him. And he's like, Nope, I'm not talking. Nope. I'm not talking. And somewhere in the distance of, a new model gunship checked in and they started firing off the 25, <laughs> the 25 Mike Mike gun. Yeah. And when you heard that thing going off that, that apparently from the report, this guy just melted in his seat and said, I'll tell you anything. I'll tell you anything. <laughs> just get that thing away. It just get it away. It's going to kill me. You know, yeah. it's like that right there had a profound uh, psychological impact on the enemy. Yeah. 
and um, it would come in play later on with one of the uh, missions that we supported. Um, I'm trying to remember the TACP, uh, Scott Losher. Okay. I don't know if you remember him or yeah, not. Yeah, for sure. Uh, he, was, um, he was with CAV down in Karbala, and it was May of 2005. We had checked in, and this is when uh, Makdata al Sadr's Mookie Boys were doing their thing. You had the Sadr militia. Right. So they had holed up, and it was like a whole other, you know, you have insurgents, but then you have this army of insurgents. So it's kind of like confusing because now they're like different factions within, it's either Shia or Sunni Islam, you know, battling each other, but they're also battling the great imperialist enemy, us, or sure. whatever else. So it's just, it's confusing as shit to keep up with all this stuff. So one night we check in, and we call it the Dogbone Mosque, because most of the country is without power or eh, power with skosh. Mm -hmm. But the mosques usually had a lot their own power generation. Well, the Imam Ali Mosque or the Imam Ali Shrine in Karbala was one of those protected sites. And there was two mosques that are right next to each other with this courtyard in between. From the air, from a distance, at night, it looked like a dog boom. Okay. So we just called it the dog boom. You know, it was like a reference point. You know, it's you know, like as you're driving to uh, TGI Fridays, and you're like, hey, we're passing the water tower. You know, oh, right. as, a, as a visual re visual reference point. There it is. So here's the dog bone mosque, but we're checking in overhead. So the CAV, they're having a lot of problems with these guys because they're armed to the teeth. Mm -hmm. And we're overhead. We can see that they're, the insurgents are violating they are violating the protection because there's heavy, heavy crew served weapons and et cetera on the rooftop of these mosques. So yeah. now that mosque technically is no longer protected right. because they're using it inappropriately. But because of its significance, cultural significance, it was like, oh, hands off. So we're talking to the JTAC and later on, it was subsequently, I found out it was Scott Losher. And he handed the, the, the mic to the commander and the commander was like very verbose. But he said in plain, plain freaking English, look, you do not understand how important it is that we have zero, zero effects on this mosque because it will crush every effort that we had. That building that's 25 meters away, you guys, the three-story structure, you guys are, make it go away. We're like, okay. It's like type three control. <laughs> right. <laughs> 64 rounds of 105 delay into that bitch. 64 rounds of delay. And then the guys that were squirting out of the building were tracking them down with a 40 in, in the alleyways. And the 40 is, oh my God, it's, it's, it's amazing because when it hits and it frags out, you have frag bouncing off the walls, et cetera. And it just turns into a shit show for anybody that wants to live. You know, you're not going to make it. Because of my position, I really didn't have much of, you know, defending of the aircraft, as I said earlier. But... What I was doing was I was trying to help the crew keep up with what we were seeing as far as the uh, EKIA counts. Sure. So when we landed. So I had counted like, I don't know, like 30 some odd dudes that we'd tracked down and ended, you know, with that entire control for that night. And I mean, we did a lot of shooting. Uh, but we landed and then the Intel guys ran out to the plane when we landed and they say, hey, you know, the significance of what just happened, you guys need to come up here. So apparently, because we landed in the morning, apparently the next day, Maktada or Sadr and his entire militia laid down their arms and walked away. They said, yep, we're done. Really? We are, we're done. We're, <laughs> we're, I mean, you can look it up. And they said, yep, we're done. We're out. We had enough of this. So profound effects, you know, from, you know, what I'm seeing from the, you know, from the, from the air and versus what I had in my career on the ground, it was like, you know, this is night and day. This is, I mean, we're having profound impacts oh, yeah. on this stuff. So it was, it was quite a bit. It was quite a bit to take in. Um, but this is where a lot of, um, in the gunship culture at the time, uh, and in, in the soft community, and I'm sure that the same is true up at, this, up at the 17th, at the time, it was like, yeah, this, this is our job. We're going to do it. And yeah, this is great. You know, high fives all around, you know, the, all this kind of crap. But there wasn't anybody to decompress any of this stuff with. Sure. And uh, they just kind of built and built. Because I, I came home, I had a, how was your deployment? I uh, can't talk about it. You know, it was yeah, it was horrifically awesome, but I can't talk about it. So I had nobody to talk to. And I was kind of like, you know, building up, building up, building up. 
Um, but it was, I mean, it was, it was great to be a part of the gunship community. And it was like, wow, this is, this is, this is awesome. Um, and I, I really think that I had a, a profound positive impact on, you know, everybody around me, but my career was like, you got to do something. And somebody said, Hey, there's, this, there's, there's this airborne jump position available up at Fort Benning. Who's interested. They tried to direct somebody to go up. And this one guy's like, no, this is per the reg. You, you can't, you can't make people go up to a position they don't want to take, especially if it's a jump position. And I was like, I'll go, I'll go. And they're <laughs> ignoring me the whole time. And I was like, I was already, I was already or more qualified. I'm like, I'll go, I'll go. You know, I can, I can do this. So finally the, the boss was like, all right, we'll have a sit down conversation. And, um, I was like, yeah, I want to take this position. He's like, all right, this is going to take you out of the cockpit. This is a very different, um, career move, you know? And, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, I'm all for it. So that's when I came with the Fort Benning up with you guys. And, uh, that was when I had the the true awakening, if you will, of okay, this is <laughs> now I'm going to do it from the ground, not yeah. from the air, but from the ground, you know. Yeah, and it's it was it was a very different perspective. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because it, in the past, like when I first came in, being an ALO, it was hit and miss. Like there was a lot of guys who didn't want that job. It was like very forced on them. It was not not as highly sought after, right? So. Um, I, I could see the, your commander's point, like, look, this is going to be weird. It's going to be, you know, it might not be helpful to you or whatever. Um, but I think that's past. I think that's gone now. I think there's a lot of, and there, and frankly, there's been a lot of guys that have come up to the 17th and just crushed, you know, and guys that have excelled from there too. So uh, yeah, to your point, I mean, I think you made the right decision. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't think it was a detriment to you to come up. Don't you think? I mean, or what would you, no, I, mean, what do you think? I mean, me going up there, I mean, for me personally, uh, it was it was building, um, and it was not it was not without you know its trials and tribulations. Sure, because I, mean, I can I can and Tommy's probably going to watch the video. <laughs> um, so I did my check ride, my initial check ride for JTAC Qual, and I don't know if you remember them sending me over to Germany for my JTAC training. No, I don't um, think I remember that. No, did we all go, uh, or was it like a ranger trip, or did you just? They no, just sent- it was. They, they sent me off to, what was it, they called it JIFCO, Joint Fire Center of Excellence or something. It's okay. in, Spang, in Spangdalem, I think it was. So anyway, I did the two weeks of JTAC training with all these other people that are getting their, you know, their six-part folder signed off and all this other stuff. But at the last portion of the, uh, the trip, the training trip, the... DO kind of sat down with me and said, Hey, because you showed up with no folder, because it was like a backdoor thing. They didn't go through the normal process to put somebody into the school. Right. It's like, you showed up with no folder. We got nothing to send you back with. So I did not get my JTAC call the normal way that everybody else would, like if they went out to Vegas or whatever JTAC school that they went to. I showed up there with nothing and I came back home with nothing. And it was like, I remember, uh, I think it was Kronk was there at the time as the DO and, um, Taco was the commander and they're like, Oh, we'll work around this. So, uh, Schleich and, uh, that was when oh, I'm drawing a blank. Who was the, uh, the, the C, uh, like the evaluator. Uh, no, not the, uh, not the evaluator. Or the senior, senior enlisted guy. Brand, was yeah. Brandy, was it Brandy? It was Brandy. Okay. It was Brandy. That's right. That was Brandy. Um, so they said that they just came to a conclusion that we're going to just, we're, we're going to make this right. Uh, so they did all the coursework with me. We sat down, they signed off all the things that I did. I just, just finished doing while I was over in uh, Germany, right. redid everything. And then we went down to Moody Air Force Base and we had live A-10s out of one of the MOA areas. It was live dry that night and the A-10s couldn't see my position and I kept on like, okay, where's my position? I was like reading off a grid and they're like, what are you doing? Dumbass. <laughs> you can't do that. All right, <laughs> shifting our position. And I'm like, I'm sitting there with my Islid. Oh, here I am. Here I am. No, nothing, nothing's working. So I eventually uh, called in, a, you know, this notional strike and Schleich was like, well, what about the gunships that we briefed to you that were notionally in the uh, stack? The A-10s just went through, the, went through them and it was like an instant Q3. And I was like, God, Oh, <laughs> oh, dumbass! And you're a gunship dumbass. guy. You should have, you should have right. known that, right? <laughs> 
but I was I, in my mind. I was like, "There's no gunship here. I don't hear it." Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear any voices on the line. You know what's what's going on? Oh, it's, for sure. Oh, so, more guys get more guys get dinged on notional stuff. It's it's very. Yeah. It, I I find that harder than having actual assets in the air because you forget about them. You're like, "Oh, you got a set of, of Apaches that are uh, off to the east," and you're like, you've, "And they're not real." So you just forget about them. anyway. To your point, yeah, it's it's hard to keep track if they're not in your ear. You know letting you know their exactly presence. so um it was after the fact we uh stayed an extra day or two it was just tommy and myself uh, i think it was before he was taking over b flight um so we stayed in moody and we did a couple of controls um and we're out in the i don't know one of the far southeastern areas and he's we're just going over all the equipment um and it was great you know it it, it he boosted my confidence because we we talked about exactly what it is that i screwed up and, you know, I was like, I'm still here to admit, you know, how I screwed things up. And it was, by the way, one of those things that I would, even if it's notional, I would carry through the rest of my career of making sure you have airspace awareness. Sure. So it, it paid off yeah. later on. Um, so, it was, you know, it's like one of those things, you know, the, the things you remember the most, the things you do the best are those things that you screw up, you, you learn oh, for the, sure. the best lessons in life from those things that you make from the mistakes you make. Right. So yeah, it was, it was great. So I, I remember it was later on, um, it was when we were B flight and I was doing an, uh, an eval with Tommy and we're near, I guess it was east of Lake Eufaula and we had some fast movers. I don't remember what it was. F F F 16s or F 18s. I don't remember what, so he's driving a blue steely, uh, the, the, that six pack truck that we had yep. before Mark Foster destroyed it <laughs> right. with his flip flops, um, <laughs> driving with his flip flops. Um, and we're checking in and we're like, Hey, we need a position. And I'm like reading off a grid. We're on this road. And we're like, yeah, we're, you know, we're negative. I just pull out my signal mirror and Tommy is driving. He's like, what the f- are you going to do with that? And I'm like, I don't know. And I put on the up on the dashboard i'm sitting there trying to do this little number like hey, you see me and all of a sudden it comes the you hear the air set come back visual nice tommy's looking at me like what the shit just happened <laughs> <laughs> how did you do that and i'm like i don't know but it worked <laughs> hey, all right but yeah it was it was it was great it was great um lots of interesting learning points uh through the deployments that i did with the rangers when i came on as the b flight uh oic I guess when I'm, I guess they're called something else now. I don't I don't know what it is. So um, we do these deployments, and I'm you know introduced to the Rangers. I remember I remember that was actually before I got the position with uh, Third Battalion when we had that uh, F-16 guy come in, Shag, uh-huh. and uh, they had a lot of there, there was a lot of interesting issues that popped up with that, um, and n- n- not holding anything against anybody, but it was I just remember from my perspective that. Uh, Tom, when Tommy came in and said, Hey, let's just get Lurk to do this. And, um, I think Kronk was the commander at the time and Kronk was against it, but they went ahead and did it anyway. And all I remember is walking over to third battalion headquarters. And I was like, I was going to meet the, the RCO. It was a uh, Walrath. Okay. So I walk in, I check in with Walrath and he's like, well, so what, what kind of crazy call sign do you have? And I'm like, Jim, <laughs> and then he just kind of sat back and he's like oh we're gonna get along nice i like this yeah exactly <laughs> i'm like I, I don't know what I, I, sorry i don't have a crazy call sign right I right come up later when uh you know when we're at arkman uh maybe i earned a call sign there <laughs> i was wondering if you wanted to talk about that uh do you want to do you want to go over yeah. that at all or okay <laughs> I don't. I don't know where. Because like, here's the deal. It like as much as people put it all on you, it was not all on you. Because that that anyway. Go ahead. Tell the story, and then we'll we'll talk about it. Oh yeah, yeah. So um, Arkman, yeah, it was Arkman DZ out on the uh, was it the northeastern side of uh, Fort Benning now Fort Moore. Yeah. Um. So we did a. It was a, what, a weekend jump trip that we're just going to bust a lot of silk. You know, we're just, we have a, a UH-1N, a uh, naval uh, helo coming in to support us. Or no, it was Marine Corps. Marine Corps, it yeah. Was Marine, yeah, it was Marine Corps, yep. a UH-1N. Yeah, MAG-42, I think it was. I can't remember the, the helicopter squadron designation, but it was that Marine Air Group that was in Atlanta that would come down and support us. Yes. Yeah. 
And it was not the same trip where they brought the Marines that, that they put their entire stick in the trees. That was a different trip. Oh, that was different. Okay. Yeah, because that was that was when that was after Stan House broke his leg. Oh, okay. Out out west, out in the um, NTC. Right, right. Because he was him and I were on uh, quads running around trying to coordinate getting all those all those guys out of the trees. But yeah, we it was like I was going to be my fourth jump of the day, and it was like we had families out there at the at the DZ. Yeah, you know, people all hanging out, you know, this that and the other. But it was later on in the afternoon, and I noticed that. Um, cause I think I'm pretty sure Adam Root was there. Um, I don't remember who else. We had a bunch of guys from the OLs that were in town. Like I know yes. OLA was there and some SF guys from Bragg were there. Uh, yes. A bunch of dudes were there. Yeah. So I think, uh, OL chicken Hawk from, uh, Campbell. I think a couple of those guys were there as well. Probably, yep. Um, I, cause I think it was Jared Hodges was also there. I think, I don't remember. But anyway, long story short, it was like the last jump of the day. And I I just remembered that like, okay, it's um, the safety was Jazz Erickson. He was the, because uh, they only had a position for, you know, he had to do two roles. Right, he right. Was the, he was the safety and he was also the. I forgot uh, it was Jazz. I was, I was wondering, I couldn't remember if it was me or Jazz. And I'm glad you clarified that because I, you know how that stuff goes. You like, because yeah. you. I think we switched out a bunch that day. Like we, I think I don't think he was the safety all day because that's a hard job. Because in a UH one, the the static safety stays on the bird, and you just wear the headset yes. and you just put everybody out, and then you you do elevators. So I couldn't remember if we were rotating out or anywho. Yeah. So yeah, it was it was it was a long day. So I was sweaty, and we're all wearing our uh, our BDUs. Yeah. Uh, most of us anyway, and it was my it was going to be my fourth jump. But I I didn't, and I'll just I'll. I'll lead up to it i re- i just remember that um every stick leading up to the incident that i was my butt you know you're gonna do a up and out and i guess i wasn't doing an up and out enough because it was like my pack the bottom of a pack and then it was the, that was the first jump the second jump it was part of my ass and then the <laughs> third jump my ass hit the the skid the skid <laughs> so it was like it wasn't up and out enough so it was the fourth jump, and it was the tape, and I think it was Gav that had put the the tape on it because he came up to me later on. And he's like, "Yeah, dude." He's like, "I'm I'm the one that taped it up." And um, they what put the tape, tape what up the uh, the thing you got hooked on? Yeah, the tab. Oh, okay. So there's there's two tabs on either skid. You have a front and a rear tab that are on the top end. You have to put a bunch of tape on it so you don't get ho- hooked on anything. And that right. tab is for um, a wheel that they use when they. They lift it up, they put this wheel on it, and it locks in place, and they can wheel it into a hanger and wheel it back out, and then they take the wheel off, and it does its thing. Right, right. So that's the tab that they put on there, or the uh, the tape they put on that tab so you don't hit it. So that was, I guess it was part of, and you did the safety investigation on it. <laughs> yeah. Or part of it. Um, so, yeah, it was that last jump. I went out, and I went out, and up and over and all I could see was, you know, white. And I'm like, I looked up out of the corner of my eye and I saw somebody come down, you know, next to me. And I'm pretty sure that was Adam root. I'm not sure who it was. All I remembered, he was like looking up, like, (laughs) I'm like, I'm counting, you know, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000. I'm seeing all these other guys going down and descending and I see canopies. I'm looking up and I'm seeing canopies. I'm like, what the hell is going on? And I look down at my feet and I'm like, there's a bottom of the bird. There's a lot of, uh, looks like oil and stuff leaking out the bottom of the bird. And I'm still on this mother. <laughs> I look up and I'm like, Holy shit. I'm still attached. How am I attached? And I'm holding on to my reserve. Like, Oh my God, this could, this could, this could be bad quick. Yeah. You know, it was a very dangerous situation because yeah. had you deployed that reserve, I mean, that thing could have gone to the rotor blades. I mean, who knows what it could have happened, yep. you know? Yeah. Um, but, jazz is looking out and he's like you know <laughs> tapping on me it was like after like about two or three minutes because i think that y'all said that oh we got five jumpers and it's like wait a minute we should have six <laughs> right what's what's going on where's where's the other one and it's like did he fall did he shoot not open what's going on <laughs> and he's like yeah hey, i'm gonna cut you free and i'm like no no <laughs> that's not <laughs> i don't even know what so we would they, have cut because you were hung up by your saddle so if yeah. they, we would cut, I mean, it was, I don't even know if you could have gotten down there to cut your saddle. I don't know, man. I mean, and you were so far away. I think you were far enough where they couldn't kick you off. And I mean, it was just, it was a really bad situation. Yeah, it was, so it was 14 minutes of hanging completely upside down like an opossum. And, uh, 
Were they able to get like any kind of strap to hook you up to, like a safety I, strap? I don't think so. I don't even think they could do that. No, no I think you were too far away. Could. Yeah, so it was it was it came down to a low hover, uh, and that's and I think it was was it you? But I know it was Schleich. Two or three guys came out and they lifted me yeah. my upper torso upright so they could get the tension off <laughs> right. of the leg strap. And then release, release me. And as soon as my feet hit the ground, I was like, that counts. <laughs> and they're like, no, it doesn't count. I'm like, that counts. <laughs> I jumped out. You jumped out. That's right. And it's the, the, the most dangerous part, what we were worried about was, yes, at altitude, you're good if you fall off. But as you're descending, you know, you're getting lower and lower. And once you pass a certain point, if you fall off that, that you know, whatever you're hung up on, that the chute's not going to deploy. So you're going to free fall down, you know, two or 300 feet. So that was, we were all kind of worried, like just kind of like hoping you didn't fall off when you're descended past like four, 400 or something. I don't know what, I don't know what we were jumping. Was it dash ones or was it like a T10 or I don't know what kind of shoots we were jumping that day. I like, were they, did, were you able to steer them or was it just, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So, I mean, you got to have a, a, I don't know exactly the altitude, but it's at least a thousand feet or 800 or something to, at least get any lift out of that that shoot, maybe maybe higher. So yeah, so that was that was crazy. So it went from like kind of being funny that you didn't get out to like, oh man, let's let's get him down. It was kind of, you know, we were a little worried about it. And then once we got to, you know, got you down, it was fine. But <laughs> that was crazy. Yeah, and then it was like somebody had vi- somebody has video of it. I don't know who had a video camera, I but I remember there. I know. Somebody Hopefully, somebody camera. seeing this will like post it or share it or something because i know yeah. we have pictures we had video but i have not seen any of it since for i mean i know it was on the server at the 17th i know i put it on a folder somewhere but i could i can't find it yeah because you you sent up the the safety report and yeah, right and then it was years later i was i was flying in the u28s and pete muley reached out to me and he was like yeah hey, i just went through jump master training blah 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 and you're the safety brief <laughs> i'm like awesome oh. <laughs> I'm famous for something. You know, right. like, why, not, why not be a safety brief? Yeah. You're, the reason, you're the reason why we have to do this shit. You know, <laughs> awesome. You know, like we talk about it, and now we have we have photos and video of it. And here it is. What was uh? Did it was it painful at all hanging there, or was it? Were you just kind of like? Oh, yeah, it? it was a it was a little bit of pain that, um, because the saddle the uh, the, the leg strap it was on my. Uh, left leg when it hit the tab that this, the bottom saddle portion got on the tabs and when i rotated over it just like it was like a tourniquet yeah it was like it was like one of those cat tourniquets sure times 10 because oh, it was man. like all my weight and so i had lost blood flow to my leg completely i remember like when i got when i laid on the ground it was like schleich or you i don't remember who but somebody was like hold me up while I was walking around because my leg was like dead asleep. Oh man. But I also had like a really bad headache because I was upside down. Right. For 14 or maybe it was seven minutes. I don't remember. It felt like forever. Yeah. Cause my, you know, everything was completely 180 degrees out, you know, with visual reference. Sure. Okay. Sure. <laughs> the horizon was upside down. Man. So. Yeah. But that it was, crazy. it was great. Was that, did you uh, jump again after that? Or was that, that was the last jump you said we didn't jump anymore after that. Jump. For that day, okay. uh, the next the next day we we jumped. Yeah, Arkman so. was crazy. It seemed like one of those drop zones that was just big enough, just legal enough to jump. Like it was not, there was no slop. You know, there was no extra room. That's why, like to your point, like what you said before, you know, we put a bunch of whole stick of Marines in the trees, just because Arkman was so tight. They did it. Yeah, right. They yeah, yeah, we didn't do it for sure. Yeah, their their jump master did it, and it was like, oh shit. Yeah. We had uh, we called flat iron. Out of um, Rucker, which is now Nevisol or whatever its name is now, but yeah. Flatiron came out with their Jungle Force Penetrator to get the guys out of oh, the troops. Right, right. And they had to take the one guy uh, to the hospital because he was like, the only thing he had was his boot was tied up in his uh, all the lines, the risers. Man, that was the only thing that was holding him. He was like 20, 30 feet up in the air, and I remember. Um, Kevin Laliberte and I were trying to get lines up there, climb yeah. up into the trees to secure him because that was the only thing that was holding him. If he would have let go, I mean, he was going to land on his head. Yeah. Didn't we call uh, out Sean too? Didn't Sean O'Neill? He was working at Building Four, I thought, and he had brought out like a clear tree climbing kit or something, or yeah, brought us some yeah. help. Yeah. We like 
We had everybody was, coming was, out for that one. Jesus, it was a, that was a f***ed up day. And then we went out the what, the following week to try to get some of the shoots out of the trees. And yeah. That didn't work. No. Um, yeah, fun times. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, tell me about some of your deployments while you're at the 17th. I mean, tell me, uh, tell me about that. Uh, so, yeah, I did uh, quite a few deployments. It was I did the Siege of Soda f- uh, when I first got there. And that was when my third kid was born um, at Fort Benning. Okay. So I was I was at the jock in the Siege of Soda uh, at uh, Balad. So that was what six months, five months, six months, something like that that I was gone. Uh, it was a great deployment, but it was kind of like mundane. Yeah. Uh, I had uh, all of our SF guys that were supporting all the SF soft guys. So we had uh, Jared Hodges, um, Scott McPhee, Pat DeCrasto. Uh, Zach Atkinson, uh, or a couple of the guys that I remember that were scattered throughout. And there are a couple other guys that were out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I don't really remember all their names, but, um, Nick Wise was one of them. And that's when Chris Cordero as a, as a young airman, he showed up and he was with me at the jock. So it was, uh, uh, Nick Wise. Um, so that was their first experience, I guess, in the, the soft field and that was just sitting at CG Soda. Mm-hmm. And then I left there. Uh that was then fast forwarding and that's when I got on with third battalion and yeah. I did their deployments with them. And that was an interesting because it was like a lot of shooting, but it was a, being a gone a lot because he had all the TFTs and all the other pre uh workups to each deployment. So we had a lot of cash trips. Right. We had the jump trip out at um Oh, what was the name of that place out in North of Holloman where they had the craziness ensue at the O Club? Um, Stallion DZ, we jumped into there. Okay. Um, there was there was just a lot of crazy stuff that that led up to all these you know deployments. And we, I did two solid deployments with Third Battalion. No, there was three. I did three deployments with them. Okay. And I just remember that, you know, there was, I'm, I'm in the jock at uh, Salerno, you know, working the, the fires desk and um, working with all these other, you know, organizations, if you will, right. to keep it, to keep it on that level. Um, it was very interesting because we were, we were, we were, weren't doing a whole lot, but we ended up doing a lot once they, cracked the code, if you will, found sure. out that a lot of their training camps in uh, eastern Afghanistan were in the mountains above 10,000 feet. So we would strike, do a strike, and then we'd send a group in. Uh, Tommy was with, with me on a lot of those deployments. Yeah. Um, and he was going out with the, uh, the companies after we would do all those workups. And it was, I remember that one deployment where every morning he would come back from, you know, whatever mission we'd go out on the picnic table and he'd smoke. And he's like, you want to smoke? No, I don't smoke, man. You know that. Hey, you want to smoke? I don't smoke. And then finally I, I, you know, I succumbed to it. And I, I picked up smoking. I never smoked in my life. And I smoked for like eight months. I was like, damn Thanks it. a lot, Tom. God, and Tommy. Uh, I love him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was great. I mean, it was the, the one thing that I do it, 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 I mean, it was great, great camaraderie with, with all the guys, but you know, that one year of, uh, 2009, I was, I spent 310 days gone Jeez. from that, from the family. So it was, yeah. it was, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was a lot on me. It was a lot on my family, but you know, I also had to look back on all of you guys, you yeah. know, what was it like for all of you guys? Cause you guys were, you know, I was there for three years. You guys were there for like what? 10, 12 years. Yeah. Some, some guys. And were. it was, and it's like, holy crap, you spent your entire career there and you're gone. Yeah. You're not there. How do you, you know, what kind of family life is that like? Oh, I've often said like, uh, it's not a family job for sure. I mean, it, it, we have made it work. We've, you know, a lot of us have had a lot of trials and, you know, hardships and stuff but I, I always tell guys man wait for the family come in here it's a kick-ass job i wouldn't tell anybody not to do it even if they have a family but wait on the family come in do do the job for about four or five years six years whatever and then then have your family or because it's not 
I, and God, God love them. The, the wives that, that put up with this kind of stuff that hang around, I mean, they're, they're rock stars, you know, I mean, it's not an easy thing to do to, you know, have a guy come in for a couple of, a couple of weeks and then he's gone again for a couple of weeks and you got to take care of the kids and you got to run the household and everything. I mean, it's very tough, um, on a, on a family. So I always tell guys just wait, wait on having a family, do the cool stuff. And then, you know, there's, there's going to be time later on to do all that stuff, but yeah, it's rough. It's rough for a family guy for sure. Yeah. And I showed up with my family. Right. And it was, um, it was, it was hard on us, but you know, we may, we may do, we definitely yeah. may do. And that's what I'm saying. Like a lot of, a lot of families do. And it's, I, it's not to say it can't be done. I'm just saying it's really tough. And if you have the option, <laughs> do, do the family thing later. But yeah, a right. lot of guys like you, you know, a lot of dudes showed up with families and it's, it, yeah, it's just tough. It's a tough thing. Especially for the kids. I mean, the kids are like, yeah. and dad's not, dad was here. Now he's gone again. And you know, it's like, and a lot of guys will come on here and they'll talk about their kids are like, they only wouldn't even want to go to work. Like they're like, no, I'm just going to work. I'll be back tonight. Because every time the dad leaves the house, they don't know if he's, you know, if he's going on right. employment for six months or eight months. And yeah, it's really rough. It's rough on them. Yeah. And I actually dealt with that a lot later I'm on. I'm sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, a lot of shenanigans. But there is one trip that I have to mention. Yeah. Um, God, it was. <laughs> What's up, Tommy? That's that, that. That should say enough. So we did a um, a cash trip up to Maryland. Okay. And Pete, Pete Muley's from up in that area. So we did this cash trip up there, and we're working with A10s uh, all over the place, um, and we we're. I forget all the locations that we went to. Um, like dry stuff like in the Moas? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Best. Those um, are the best. So we're all over um, um, Maryland and especially uh, these outlying areas. But I remember that one day we, we we stopped at a convenience store. And they're like, yeah, we're going to get some road Cokes. And I'm just sitting there in, in the, <laughs> the rental. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. So they go in and they get whatever and they come back out. And they hand me this this beverage. And I was like, oh, it's an energy drink energy drink it's a spark i'm like okay cool pop it we're driving i'm actually driving with a spark and i had no idea what this was because i just i didn't you know hey they hand it to me and it's just an energy energy drink right yeah. this rental full they're like oh yeah and they're all popping theirs and then we're driving and we get pulled over oh my we god get pulled over and the cop is like Comes up and he's like, "So, uh, where are you guys? What are you guys doing?" It's like, "Oh, we're military. We're going to we're going to this. You know, we're working with uh, this unit, this A10 unit out of the uh, Maryland area, etc." And he's like, "So, uh, why are you guys drinking?" I'm like, uh, "It's just an energy drink." And he's like, oh, "You might want to look at it again." I'm looking. I'm like, "Malt liquor." And I just <laughs> looked up from the can and looked at Tommy. I'm like, "You, oh my God, seriously." <laughs> He's like, well, I'm going to need to talk to your commander. And and I'm like, that would be me. <laughs> He's like, well, you know, who's your NCYC? And it's like, it would be the guy that gave me the drink. <laughs> and I'm like, really, really? This is this is happening right now. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so what yeah. happened? Did the cop let you go? Right, yeah, you let us go. He's like, yeah, you got to get rid of that stuff. Oh, you guys man. go ahead and go on. And I was like, oh, my God, this is, this is so embarrassing. So was it? Did, were you the only one that didn't know Spark was malt liquor, or was everybody like? I, surely not everybody. I, they probably I'm were just sure messing they, with they, you, right? I'm sure they were just messing with me. Okay. I, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure. But I, you know, I was like, I don't, I don't drink the stuff. I just thought, oh, Spark, it's, a, That's it's an energy drink. All right, let's do this. Thank oh, you very man. much. No more. No more. <laughs> Good grief. Oh. Yeah, there was, there was, there were, I mean, the shenanigans that went on up at the 17th were just like oh. on the nth level. I yeah. Mean, I, re, I distinctly remember uh, flying in the gunship. It was like they had the, uh, it was in their policy that you had to have, during all combat operations, you have to have your, uh, your flight gloves, your uh, flight boots, which were issued that met the flight, uh, criteria you know for like crash accidents this that and the other sure. you had to have your parachute harness on but we had the uh it was a rescue parachute but it was the chest style it, you just clip it on real quick okay so it's kind of like our reserve sure so we just had to have a harness on and you had to have this you know when you needed to you could grab the parachute and clip it on and then bail out mm -hmm. 
and your helmet, but nowhere in the regulation did it say you had to have anything else on. <laughs> so it was very <laughs> common for the for the gunners as they're working the guns to just literally have that on and nothing else. I mean, nakedness. <laughs> I mean, absolute nakedness. And was it because it was hot or they, they were just crazy? Well, it, it would get cool. It would get really cold up at altitude, but it yeah. was just, you know, crazy. It was like the whole psychological <laughs> impact of things. Sure, sure. Um, so in this one gunner in particular, Ben Felix, and he would wear his leopard print thong around with that. And that's, that's it. He would always sit down right next to me and he's like, what's going on, Ewo? What are we doing, Ewo? Do you know where we are, Ewo? And it's like, Ben, you're not going to get a rise out of me. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> you're right. Go bug somebody else with, you know, you're having nothingness on. <laughs> right, right. But that was, you know, that level, you know, we had discussions and this, that, and the other on the gunships, but the, the crazy crap that ensued when I was at the 17th was just, I mean, it was like up and, 10, 10 more degrees. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next we level did that. stuff. Oh man, it was great. Holloman at the O club. I'm surprised that we were not arrested and thrown out <laughs> of the crap that was going on. Brandy with his cockos. Um, and then Jared Hodges was out there with the base commander doing a pull up contest on the awning and they broke the awning uh <laughs> but i mean it was like com camaraderie that sure, was actually sure. the, that was the trip where uh bull adams was there and uh taco bell colonel bell was there mm -hmm. and we got shot at by the uh the german air force oh right right that was the incident where we got we i guess we were on the on the range we were at the gate and we were checking in and there was just some, it was a gross misunderstanding. And I'm so grateful that nobody got killed. Yeah. Lucky. But I mean, it was, there was a lot of bad shit happened. You know, there was things that should not have taken place that happened. Sure. And it was, it was not our fault. It was absolutely oh, 100%. Not, whatever. It was, uh, and it, I don't want to say it's the German's fault, but you know, you should have known a hell of a lot better than this. Right. Um, I mean, I don't think there's ever been movers on that range. Like he should have known. No. If he sees movers on that particular range, that that's probably not a target. Right, right. So the whole incident is, and Schleich, I'm fairly certain he was there. Oh, yeah, he was. Uh, and we were at the gate. And there was like five or six rental vehicles. And I was in the uh, the Chrysler town and country. with. I was sitting right behind Bull. He was driving, so I was right behind him. And we're all going. We got cleared into the range from the range control. And we're talking to the JTAX, or they couldn't get, reach the JTAX at the OP. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly what had transpired, what what was the fall in communication with that. But we got clearance because it was like well after, past the time for us to get on the range. And they're like, hey, we need to get on the range and get you know get the controlling because we got a timeline to fill. Right. So we're barreling down the road, and the next thing you know, there's dirt and thump, 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 thump all around us. Like, what the is going on and we're like halfway on the range and this is what uh i forget the it was if you look at where holloman is it's to the south and east it's just north of uh bliss the range yeah the, yeah it was like red rio or centennial or something like that wasn't it i think it's centennial i think yeah. it's centennial because red rio i thought is up north and centennial is down to the yeah, south i can't remember which one's which but yeah one of those right right yeah so they had some old F4s and shit like that out there, containers and little mock village, this, that, and the other. But we're just like, I don't know, like three miles into this or two miles into this, and all of a sudden we get lit up by their guns. Hot. Yeah. From the German tornadoes. And I'm like, what the fuck is actually happening right now? <laughs> we get to the a rally point by the gate, and we're checking everything out. Everybody's okay. It became this huge, huge investigation. Yeah. You know, it was, and a lot of people got, Q3 to like immediately that day. I want to say, uh, I just talked to, I think like said it on here or we talked about it or something, but he was just there recently. And those guys still to this day claim it was our fault that that, that happened like that. Jesus. It's not true, dude. It's a hundred percent. Not at all. Not at, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Crazy. Blame us because you know, we're always the redheaded stealth. Sure. Sure. Had to be you the know, ground guys. Out. Had to be the, the JTAX. Yeah. Couldn't have been the air crew. Or, you know, their oh, range control. Yeah. Yeah. They had, uh, did they have JTAX out there? They had somebody that was at the control tower. I don't, I don't remember who was out there first. I, I don't know. If, yeah. I don't remember the, those details, but yeah, but it was a, that was a, an amazingly up trip. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was like, wow, this is scary. Yeah. You guys, I mean, I wasn't there. I, I came in the next day 
and heard about it. Got wind, picked me up from the airport, and uh, man, I, you guys are so lucky you didn't get smoked on that one for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good God. <laughs> but yeah, that was a that was a crazy trip. That was yeah. like yeah, turning it up to the nth level to the extent that we're almost going to get killed. <laughs> I mean, I've, <laughs> so crazy. But yeah, it was. Um, that was a, that was all eye opening for me in my military experience was you know being at the seventeenth was now taking a step back and then going back into the air and I uh, I wasn't going back to the uh, gunship because they're going to make me an EWO again and I wasn't going to be an electronic warfare officer and do pretty much nothing right in permissive environments I'm like I, I I'm, I've done so much up to this point you no. know. Let me do something else. And that was when the U-28s just kind of fell into my lap. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do that shit. I heard about those guys. Yeah. So I went back to uh, Hurlburt in 2010, uh, qualified as a combat systems off- officer in the uh, U-28, and did a couple of deployments. Nothing really glorious with the U-28s. I did four deployments with them. And my first deployment was to the Philippines. Uh, second deployment was to Afghanistan. Third deployment was back to the Philippines. And then my final deployment uh, was I set up an austere kind of, uh, I would say, the pinnacle of um, soft aviation when we set up a, a U-28 small deployment area in West Africa. Nice. And we're, we're supporting missions out there, actually supporting the French. Oh, Really? Yeah, it was the French are crazy, <laughs> man. And as much smack people talk about the French, I will, I will say that yeah, I, I respect their soft guys because yeah. we were working with their tier one guys, and they had just like six guys that one night uh, jumped out and out of their aircraft into the middle of the Sahara, and they were going to do a twenty-eight kilometer movement to their objective, and it was like. Holy crap. Not only did, did they do that, but one of the guys broke their legs and they just like, okay, we're going to leave him here. Somebody will be along in here in a couple hours to get him. And the rest of the guys just went and it was like, you just left your dude. Yeah. Okay. All in the middle fun. of Sahara, no, no less. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> so we marked the position, called the French. This is where your guy is. Um, but yeah, it was, that was the U-28s were... Uh, where I learned the airspace piece all over again, yeah. uh, bring that back in from the 17th, my 17th experience, as well as other experiences that I had throughout, you know, air to ground, air, back in the air. Um, one of my deployments in the Philippines were supporting uh, this, whatever they had there. I don't, I don't remember the soft element, but they were supporting the, the, the Philippine government mm-hmm. and, we're over the southern island of Mindanao, and we're just had eyes on whatever random village shit. You know, hey, sh- shift your sensor here, shift your sensor there, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden you see the the ground just erupt. And I'm like, what the shit is that? And then another one. I'm like, those look like impacts. Hey, pilot, did, did does this look like impacts to you? And he, another one. I'm like. And so I shift my sensor, and then the impacts were following whatever I was looking at. No coordination, nothing. I didn't hear anything about it. All I was, I'm just suddenly seeing these impacts. Yeah. I'm like, I'm looking at a random village of people, and suddenly there's impacts. Turns out, after a, a couple of uh, calls, that the military was targeting off of what we were looking at. And I'm like, well, there was no coordination. I have no idea who we're looking at. You know that. And what are they shooting? And is it going to hit me? And is it, you know, like, come on, dude. Because it was like, but that, you know, so backing up after after we finally got a hold of somebody, I immediately said, hey, pilot. I turned off my uh, the broadcast for a sensor. I was like, pilot, 270 now and climb. He's like, why? And I was like, well, there's impacts. We have a trouble T. What's trouble T? And he's like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, what's the max ord? Max Ord, what are you talking about? Like somebody's targeting off of what we're seeing. Right. You can see this. And he's like, yeah, there's their impacts. Somebody's targeting based off of a sensor. They're using artillery. Do we know what the Max Ord is on this? So that's like the whole 17th piece right. carrying it over. And I'm like, holy shit, I have no <laughs> idea. 
you know, we could have shells coming well into our, you know, our altitude. Yep. I have no idea what they're using. They're using 105s, 120s. I, I have no idea. Right. Nobody knew. So we eventually get a hold of the soft liaison. It's like, yeah, we need you to get back over. I'm like, nope, we're landing. Full stop. We'll have a discussion about this when we land. Yeah. Um, so that didn't, yeah, that didn't go over too well. Uh, we pushed that information up to our command and, um, yeah, I guess they had, I don't know what came of it, but I was like, yeah. Oh, you didn't talk to the guys once you got on the ground? Oh, you we, had somebody we else talked to them. Yeah, but what the was the deal? Is, Did they say what they were shooting? They just said, no, we're just passing the information over to the fills and the fills are doing whatever. And I'm like, do you know who they were? No, we don't know. I'm like, do you think that there, maybe there were civilians? You know, you're going to be culpable if there's an investigation. You gave them this information. We gave you this information. You know, all of our stuff is recorded and we yeah. broadcast it and we took this stuff and we sent it back to our command. Somebody's going to be investigating this stuff. Right. Do you understand the gravity of the situation? So, well, I mean, I don't, but think I mean, all that's really important happened. for sure. But like, kind of like we're alluding to, or kind of like we said, you can't just shoot stuff when you got aircraft in the air. I mean, that's the, that's like day one stuff. Yeah. You can't just, you know, start blasting. I mean, you're, you're lucky you didn't take one in the belly of your aircraft or whatever, you know? Jesus, that would have that would have sucked. <laughs> you know, yeah. Oh man. No, but, but the, I love the U twenty eight man. That that thing, uh, it was so versatile, and it would, you know, it, it would it helped out on many targets. You know, and we kind of got, as you probably know, as you do know, we kind of cheated. We kind of like um, we were a little spoiled uh, where we were. You know, we had a stack, you know, five or six aircraft at any given time. You know, we always had anything we needed. The U-28 would kind of take the stack from us, and we could just, you know, he would deconflict all the airspace. And it was really, those guys made it super easy. And they were like, squirter control. And it was, man, it was, uh, they really nailed it. They really, they were really a great asset to have. Yeah, and you hit the nail on the head. So that's primarily why I was looking at that asset from, I was sitting at the jock. Uh, this was my, I think it was my final deployment. I was in Salerno at, uh, at the jock and I had to, my time was coming up. I was already notified that I had to go back to fly. So I'm like, Oh crap. So I got to call the personnel officer who I knew at the time. Yeah. Uh, the AFSOC a one. And I was like, Hey PD, Ken Peterson. Um, I was like, Hey PD, um, I need to come back to flying. And I guess they, you know, they want me to come back to the gunship. And he's like, yeah, I'm like, I'm telling you right now, I'm not going back as an EWO and go back as a FOCO, but I'm not going back as an EWO. And he's like, well, you have to call the squadron. You have to work it out. So I called the squadron uh, that night, and I talked to the one of the ADOs or the DO. Um, and turns out he was going to be, later on, he was going to be one of the uh, commanders of the U-28 squadron. But he's, okay. he tells me immediately, he's like, yeah, um, it, coming back as anything other than an EWO is not in the cards for you. Yeah, we need EWO, so we're going to bring you back as an EWO. I'm like, all right, yeah, thanks a lot. I uh I'm, I'm done. Uh, I hung up the phone with him. And I called Ken Peterson back. and I was like, hey, tell me more about this U-28. I want to come back as U-28 because as I was sitting in the jock, and this is just from my experience, sitting in the jock, doing the jock cast piece or supporting you guys out on the objective, the U-28 checked on. And it was like, I mean, I couldn't, I had to be at my seat. I had to coordinate, control, manage everything for you guys to take a lot of that burden off your shoulder. So you can do all the work that you guys are doing on the ground. So I was taking care of that air piece of so the air management piece, if you will, making sure the RAS is, you know, not violated by any kind of craziness, um, which happened quite a few times. Um, yeah, right. And then all that. But when the U-28 checked in, it was like, oh, man, I got to I've got to piss. I'm going to grab <laughs> right, some coffee. Exactly. And I just like, I put the, uh, like, yep. Draco, you got it. Put my headset down. Walk go get out some to coffee. Go you know, take a piss. Come back, you know, like, get some to eat. Come yeah. back in. Check in. Like everything. What are the updates? No, we're good to go. I'm like, all right, awesome. You know, yeah, it was the best. I'll shut up and let you guys go. But uh, yeah, speaking of a funny Roz thing that happened one night. Well, I guess it would, wouldn't have been too funny for somebody, but it was funny for us because um, it was one of those many nights that I'm sitting at the jock in Salerno. Uh, coordinating cast. Uh, this is when Kronk was up at uh, Bagram. Okay. And um, he was sitting, I guess, the fire's desk up there. And 
one of these caffeine fueled days that I had checking in like, Hey, I needed this, that, and the other. And he'd call me and say, you need to settle down on the caffeine. You know, like I'm just trying to do my job. You know? right. It was like two rippets in and five cups of coffee <laughs> later, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm wired. I'm ready to do this. You know, um, we had a Ross established and then we had this got in contact from, uh, one of the airspace controllers, like Kingpin or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, hey, um, we got this unknown rider that's out there that's in your Oz and your stock. I'm like, it's not mine. Whose is it? Well, we don't know who it is. I'm like, okay. Yeah, uh, is this Pakistani? Is this, who is this? All right. I have no idea. All right. And I call up Kronk. I'm like, hey, we got something out there. What do you have that I can get? fast mover wise that can interdict this well we got so we coordinated for some f-15s so i was launching f-15s to do an air interdiction on an unknown rider nice and then take off airborne you know i'm telling the commander hey this is what's going on we got somebody out here that's in our stock or in our stack violating airspace and i'm telling all the other air assets hey you, you guys need a clear stack we got an unknown rider out there we have f-15s inbound and this guy in the back of the jock comes up and he's like, excuse me, sir. Um, that's my asset. And um, I'm not at liberty to say what we do, but uh, that's, I'm like, now you're going to tell me Dude. when I'm about to shoot your shit out of the air. Yeah. And his little air crew, whatever, you know, it was like, you know, sweating bullets. I'm like, yeah, you're getting ready to get shot out of the air. <laughs> um, so we called it all off and it was like, it became a shit show. You know, Hey, how do you know, you need to know what you're doing. And I'm like, I did everything right. Right was you know like you don't have to be that secret like i got it we don't know what you're doing we don't know what it is but you got to at least let us know it's there i mean we you know you're gonna run into somebody or somebody's gonna run into you or we're gonna shoot it down with some f-15s or something yeah it's like come on dude (laughs) crazy shit crazy shit so it was like that whole at 17th turn it up you know 10 more degrees (laughs) um but yeah and u28s and then after my u28 piece uh i guess it was many when maddie green was at the 720th Mm -hmm. um the commander, I guess they were looking for expansion in one of their programs and they're looking for a soft halo. So I'd already been in the U-28s for four years and they'd reached out and they pulled me out of the cockpit for two years and I became an halo all over again. So <laughs> I'm a major and I'm sitting there at the 720th as the, the director of weapons and tactics and working out with uh, all their programs uh, for fielding new gear like ATAC. Yeah. It's one of the things that uh, we, we pushed through. The initial fielding of ATAC came through because of us. Nice. You guys had and a good crew true. there, I think, if I remember. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, yeah, I had Maddie Green. Well, Maddie Green retired. Um, was Buddy know. still there? Buddy MacArthur, was he still at the 720th? Buddy, Ma- ben- Buddy MacArthur was over at the, over the 2 3. Oh, that's right. That's right. Um, and that's where uh, Wes Morris was, he, Cowboy. Wes mm-hmm. Morse. Okay. Well, I work with him right now. Oh, all right. Um, and then I had uh, Jesse Brown. Was he still there, or he had he moved on by that point? Just Jesse was up at the headquarters. Okay. Um, yeah, Jesse was at the headquarters. No, he was he was at the he was at the seven twentieth, and he had moved from the seven twentieth to the headquarters. And I'm trying to navigate around the incident. Um, Bull Adams was working at the 18th flight test. And then that was right around the time, 2015, uh, August, um, when they had the parachute accident with uh, oh, Timmy. Right. Yep. And um, I was his, I was Timmy's OIC. So that whole thing, I remember I was going to physical therapy because of my back. But that was a that was a, a dark day. Uh, but you know, we we learn you know from those things and we move on. You know, he still missed. Oh, for sure. Uh, but Timmy was a great guy. I mean, Timmy, Timmy officer. Um, he was, he was a solid, solid dude. Yeah. And he was the kind of person that he could, and he, he was actually one of the guys that worked for me when I was at the 17th on my deployment at the CG Soda. Oh, nice. So he was way down South. I don't remember exactly where, but all I remember is he was on Merck talking about, you know, all of his, crazy scenarios and situations that he was in like the stripper the strip club when he was wearing <laughs> white pants and i guess she was on her cycle and they were leaving there look look at your pants and he had 
stuff all over them. And it's like, Oh my God. Um, so we had to share a, a cage together cause they were tight on space. So I moved most of my stuff out and I let him use the cage. And I just asked him, Hey, can I have the small corner of this cage? Just, you know, so I have a place to call home. Sure. And one day I, I go in there to take a shower after working out and my shower shoes are gone. My, shorts are gone i'm like what the shit what's going on apparently he took my shorts and my shower shoes because he forgot all of his shit and he wore it home <laughs> and i'm like oh my god this is this is this is crazy so uh after the incident uh after the parachute accident um i was tasked with going into his house and cleaning out his house yeah. uh packaging everything up and moving it to his next of kin and, and so i had to work with timo and all that stuff and he had went to uh, ranger school or had his bag packed for ranger school. So we had to pull out everything out of the, all of his bags, inventory, everything and pack it all back up. And there's a bag, uh, like a duffel bag, a green duffel bag. And it's like all these, and it has a checklist item of all the stuff they had to take to ranger school. Guess what I found inside that bag? Three pair of brand new shower shoes. I'm like, Timmy, are you serious right now? And you wore mine. Oh, man. So it was like, you know, it's like you can't, you, like I said, you, whatever, wherever he goes, he just lights up the room, you know, with this, yeah. this laughter. And it was like, you know, a moment of sorrow because, you know, I missed him. But I just, at that moment, you know, as I'm packing up all the stuff, it was like, I can't help but laugh. You yeah. Know, it was like, oh, there he is. You know, this is, this is classic Timmy. This is, this is awesome stuff. Um. But from that point on, uh, the commander, because of the programs that I had worked on, they wanted me to continue on with bringing all the good stuff to the special tactics battlefield airman piece. So they moved me over to my final home before I retired uh, to the 18th uh, flight test or the 18th special operations flight evaluation test squadron yeah. on Hurlburt. And I was there for because I was retiring and because I was going through an MEB, I was there for three years and I retired out. And, uh, that was end of 2018. The official retirement date was in February, February 1st of 2019. How was that over there? I knew they existed. I, I helped bull get over there, but I don't, I didn't know really what I know. I, obviously they do testing, but I don't know what, to what extent, like everything or just air crew stuff or like, Everything. Yeah, yeah, we did everything. So uh, Sal, if you remember him, Celine uh, uh, Trania. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sal, he was there. Um, and Bull. And we did all of the testing for anything that came through. So I was in charge of, they, they do they do all kinds of testing. So it's the operational test. Okay. So they'll, they'll take your, whatever your widget. So actually this is, this is a better example. So you have your device. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, your device is ready for a prime time. So it's gone through all of its developmental testing. So the fly, fix fly. Okay, will it do this? No, let's, well, let's tweak it a little bit. Then will it do this? No, let's tweak it a little bit. Now they're at the point where it's prime time. Like, okay, it's doing exactly what we want it to do. We're ready to field it. We have a fielding manual. This is the manual on how to operate this device uh, while you're doing it. Now we're going to put it in the hands of operators, give them a tr you know, basic training course on how to operate it, and then go out and use it like we intend it to be employed. Gotcha. So that's oper that's operational test. Okay. So we take it, and then from our uh, perspective, it's like, is this pot? Does this have positive impacts on what we do uh, in the military? Is this positive positively uh, bring the goodness to what we do, or sure. is there just it's it's a wash yeah, yeah or is this negatively impacting us so that's what we do for the most part. And it goes into a, a lot more levels than that you know how how well it did this this that and the other so it was actually one of the things we did was with uh the handheld link 16 mm -hmm. and the atac um one of my final test projects and we were out at um on eglin range and i was with stan house up there and we had our devices all hooked up in the in the checklist. We had to abide by the checklist, but one of our devices was just for whatever reason was just not working well. Mm -hmm. And we had a, 
a ATAC that was hooked up to it. So we unplugged that and I just immediately plugged it into another one. And the guy's like, no, you can't do that. You have to go through this, that, and the other. And I'm looking at the device. I'm like, nope, I'm up, I'm in. <laughs> and he's like, I didn't know they could do that. And I'm like, well, I didn't either, but I'm going to take notes from this. Sure. So o- operational tests, you take notes from that and like, okay, not only did, not only did it do exactly as you said it would do, we also found this other thing that is profoundly impactful to our operational needs. Sure. So we, you know, footnotes, if you will, on how well that system did. Nice. And then it, then from that point, it either gets fielded or it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. And that's from that point I retired. And then, um, now I work at, for us SOCOM doing the, uh, thing that we, well, before we started, I was talking about, yeah, yeah. um, training the jock staff, if you will, uh, going back to my days when I was in Salerno with the, with jock staff there. And it's like disjointedness of like, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you do, but you need to get out. You just get out of my face right now. Sure. You're pissing me off to the point where I know what you do. I'm in a tight position right now. I need help. Can you help me? So that's what we're imparting on those guys now is like, you know, how do we work together? How well do you work together? Cause a lot of these guys for the fir- very first time, they're meeting each other. Right. Not only do they, not, not only are they getting ready to go on a deployment for the first time, but they're meeting these other positions, these mm-hmm. other capabilities, if you will, within the jock, and that they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. So this is, you know, it's easier as the as the expression goes. It's easier to, or it's more important to sweat more now and bleed less later. Right. And that's what we're trying to impose on them. Is like, hey, learn from these mistakes that you're making in the simulated environment where you can make mistakes all day long because right. I got a pocket full of quarters. We'll, we'll throw some more quarters in this pinball machine. We can play this game all day long yeah. until you get it right. Um, and that's, that's one of the important things that we impress upon the guys as they're getting ready to move out is, you know, know and understand what the other capabilities of the guys, you know, left and right of you, what they bring to the table, what they bring to the fight. Because, you know, when there's a, when there's a scary situation, because there's, you know, the, the, whatever the case may be, and there, you know, the, the whole warfare, if you will, that, we, that you and I knew back in the days when we were up at Fort Benning, now Fort Moore, uh, those days are gone. Yeah. And the next, the next war is going to be vastly different. So we're, we, and even with that, we don't even know what it's going to look like. So we're preparing these soft guys for what we think is going to be the next bit of warfare, you know, with, you know, all these scenarios that we're hearing from the guys that are downrange right now. Right. They're like, Hey, we we came across a situation like Neo, like, you know, there's a bunch of shit going on in the middle East right now with Israel. You're right. Yeah. You know, they're getting, you know, evacuation shit. So the Neo piece, that's very realistic. So they have exercise. So the people that walking into this jock staff piece have never supported operations like that before ever or a dust one where you have uh duty status uh unknown dust one mm-hmm. where they don't you know they lost a guy or somebody's you know missing or injured badly in a friendly environment or mm, somewhat friendly environment sure, sure. how do you how do you how do you get those assets to that person to rescue them what agencies do you do you need to have an idea instead of you know being in that position at the staff level for the very first time. And so I don't know what to do. I'm, this is it. Drop Mike and walk out. You know, right. you guys can figure it out. No, now you've at least gone through a couple of practice scenarios of all this. Now you haven't, you know, it may not be the exact replica of what you're going to experience because depending on the country you have to do with your apex, uh, dip clearances, this, that, and the other walk, you know, walking through the, with the DAT or the embassy to ensure that you have all your stuff, all your ducks in a row, that may be different. But when it comes to bringing what you need to bring to the soft operators in those environments today, that doesn't change. Right. You know, it, the paperwork will change, but the the actions to help them immediately will not. And it's just going through like repetitions of solving problems, putting out fires. Like if you like you. Like to your point, like you said, you don't want the first time for you ever to deal with issue multiple issues with multiple different agencies. The first, you don't want that to be the first time you've ever done it in combat, you know. So you want to be 
I think like how many do you um do you put them through like different like you said that you got much quarters do you just put them through repetitions each day and just different scenarios and that kind of thing yes yes okay we do and the the fires piece there's there's a lot of coordination because you have uh your ROEs will depend on you know what part of the world you know what TSOC you're supporting sure they have different ROEs and plus it's like uh, even you're talking about strategic level assets like T lands yes. and high Mars and stuff and it's not just like a tens and artillery you know there's a lot of different things that you have to worry about because yeah there's a the because the stuff that we're looking at now with Lisco um large scale combat operations <laughs> right Lisco Lisco is a new uh phrase buzzword of the day mm-hmm not misinformation. <laughs> That's another buzzword. <laughs> right, right. Um, when you're talking about that, you're you're not going to have that permissiveness where you're working with a gunship and A10. You know, gunships and A10s work together like they come together like rum and coke. Sure. You know, it's that's that's like that's a JTAC's wet dream. You know, ground <laughs> really commanders is. like, yeah, I got A10s and gunships. Yeah. We don't need anything else. Right. Or you know, have U28s. Definitely have U28s. But we're looking at things where we're not going to have that. Mm-hmm. We may not have anything in the air at all. So how do you crack that nut? Right. You know, so it's, it's a whole new ball of wax and it may not even be wax. Right. It's a, it's, it's a ball of duct tape. <laughs> exactly. You know, with hair sticking out of it. I, <laughs> right. I, I have no idea. It's, Very it's, ugly. It's, 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 it's horrible. It's hideous. Yeah. And, it's it's real. It's very real. Yeah. You know how do how do you unfold this? How do you how do you prepare you know tomorrow's soft operators to do you know everything that you know we have done in mm-hmm. the past? Uh, surprisingly, though, I will have to say this, and this is this is one of the big plugs that I have absolutely want everybody that listens to this, especially the Air Force JTAC guys that are out there. Of all the stuff that I've been doing for the last almost six years now working for the uh, this, this the USOCOM mission here on Hurlburt. I have not seen a single Air Force JTAC come through in a JTAC capacity. Oh, really? It's always been Army, Navy, or Marine Corps. I've mm-hmm. never seen... I've, I've, I've let people know, hey, what's going on? I try to reach out to a lot of the uh, the guys that, you know, that I knew... Um, that were up at AFSOC headquarters. Say, hey, you need to come over and check this out. You need to get your guys in, in the know what's going on there. But I have not seen anybody come through in an Air Force JTAC in that JTAC capacity with a fires capacity going through this training. Yeah. But I think it's because the units that are going through, they have their own embedded JTACs, but I'm just not seeing any Air Force guys. Sure. And it's like, this is a sign of the times. Are we drawing back on JTEX? I don't know. You know, maybe it is. Maybe somebody else has the answer. But. I mean, yeah. I mean, especially with this uh, whole um, JTEX and Type P's trying to go in a different direction. I mean, you would think that they'd want to expose themselves to a broader array of you know capabilities rather than you know, which is I think you're doing. Like you, you, the things you would throw at them would kind of expose them to those other capabilities that they're looking to get after. I would think. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah I mean, I would. I would hope. Uh, I don't it could know. be just ignorance. I mean, I know you talk to people, but maybe they're like, this guy can't do it. They got, you know, maybe their training uh, schedule is tight or maybe they don't know about it. You know, like it's, it's hard to say. It's most, it's mostly, I will say it's mostly people just don't know about it. Yeah. They don't know what we're doing. And um, when well, how, how do they get a hold of you? Like, how do they, how would they, I mean, if you guys seeing this, how would they reach out to you? Do they just contact your shop or, you know, what, what's, the, what's, yeah. the, what's the official name of the, the so program? So we're US SOCOM J37. Uh, we fall under soft prep. Okay. And it's the soft prep training support center, STSC. Okay. And we're located on Hurlburt, uh, on the right next to the, the fire station on the west side near the air traffic control tower. Okay. Um, yeah, it's like, are the slots hard to come by? Like sometimes like nope. SOCOM likes to, they like to control kind of who does what, like I know that, you know, different exercises or different training events. They, they're like, okay, it's this, it's this entity's turn. These seals are going to go or none of these SF guys are going to go. 
I don't know if is is that the issue maybe or no, it's not. It's not. Well, the issues that we're having right now are uh, we don't have the capacity to get everybody their training that they want. Oh, okay. Because it's because we have the list is so long. Like sure. first first special forces command. Uh, they've taken up a large portion of our calendar space. Now MARSOC is taking up a, a huge section of that calendar space. We support uh, the Navy SEALs, mostly West Coast, mm-hmm. uh, but it's not exclusive. Um, we do have uh, the Air Force uh, SOTIGs coming through um, in various capacities, uh, supporting their operations. But we're mostly hands-off with them unless it's the, one of the STSs. Okay. Um, they they're mimicking or mirroring uh, a SOTIF for the most part. Right. So it's mostly like a SOTIF, but they call it a SOTIG, a special operation task group. Uh, SOTIG goes out in support of a SOTIF. So you have a SOTIF that'll deploy in location X, and you'll have a SOTIG, which is your your AFSOC airpiece that'll go with the ground piece that, that goes there, their, their air support. Oh, okay. So that's what it is. Uh, what had happened, I guess, in the in the past when you had your Jesodif, if you will, the, all the Jesodifs or the CGSodifs, or not CGSOX, sorry, the Jesoax and the CGSOX. What had happened was the TSOX were actually taking those manning positions and keeping them in the TSOX. And AFSOC was found or had found out that those positions were like a must fill. So AFSOC was pulling positions, people literally off of their duty status to support these positions and these various TSOCs because of these positions. And they were just bleeding out, you know, people. Oh, okay. And they couldn't, they couldn't support the missions. So they said, we're going to stop. We're going to rewrite all this. Now we only support in a, as directed to a SOTIF level. If a SOTIF goes out and they say, Hey, we need MC one thirties, AC one thirties, U 28s or whatever else, the SOTIG will go out as it's, command authority and underneath the SOTIG you have your SO2, your special task special operations task units so the SO2s would be your U28s, MC-130s, ac 130s will be underneath the SOTIG the group and then they would support that SOTIF or whatever it is that they have for them I guess that makes sense, that way they have a little more control over yeah. how those assets are deployed and, and then yeah. when, when they're done they bring that SOTIG back and reconstitute it okay. and it's not a, a, it's not a permanent thing so yeah, that's how they answered the Manning power vacuum, if you will, that was killing AFSOC at some point. Um, I'm sure somebody got promoted for it, but whatever. For sure, it wasn't. It was not me. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it's uh, we're we're really busy. Um, looking forward to doing a lot more work in the future. I mean, we're expanding in a in a industry where people were drawing down we're actually expanding we're opening up another office down in tampa i don't know why but it's it's because that's what the boss wants yeah um so McDill, maybe up. you know down by the hq or whatever yeah um because you'll see a lot of sf units go down there for training at my you know at mcdill yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we are looking at putting something up at uh liberty fort liberty and smart maybe some expansion elsewhere where we can get or support these agencies you know, that need this jock staff training, you know, at the soda level and on up. Yeah. And all we are is like, a, you know, a huge toolbox for whoever needs it. You know, right. we offer a throughput of a lot of simulations or simulators, I should say, sorry. Um, so all the simulators that are out there, whether it's a soft simulator or a conventional asset that we can connect them all up. So you have a jock that, say they want to control F-18s, well, we can connect to the F-18s. Oh, that's cool. And so they can actually see this. So they connect. The, the F-18 simulator will hook up to the JTAC dome, and they can actually see, just like you you remember from the jock, you know, yeah. uh, Kill TV, they'll be able to see everything, you know, unfold at the lower echelon level as those operations are unfolding. But it's all distributed. So everybody's yeah. sitting in their simulator, fat, dumb, and happy back home, training for everything and it, so it saves on a lot of uh tdy funding um you still need to go out and do your lives as you as you want sure know. sure it, but you, they're you just get, so few and far between now i mean it's hard to come by yeah. the the live sorties so yeah i was always 
I was never a big proponent of simulation in lieu of, you know, uh, live controls, but I think it's important. I think because you can do a lot of stuff in the simulator that you, that you may have a tough time doing live. You know what I mean? It's correct. Yeah. There's so many things you can add in a sim that, uh, on the, on the live range is just almost impossible without some right. moving pieces, it, but yeah, it's almost just like being deployed because even during deployment, um, you have so many quarterly things that you have to check off. Right. Like, Hey, I need, I need a, a night live or laser I need have <laughs> a, yeah, night live laser. There you go. Or, you know, from the air, air perspective, I need, I need five touch and goes. I need, you know, an ILS approach mm-hmm. and all the stuff. Well, you can't get all that stuff in a deployed environment. Right. You know? So even for the air crew, you know, that they have a requirement, you know, a quarterly or a semi-annual requirement of so many things that, you know, you just don't get. Yeah. So in the simulated environment, you can, you can get a lot of the stuff done like you need for coordination. And this is where the team building, you know, the collaboration and all that stuff comes together. Sure. You know, with the, you know, the various units where they, you know, relationship building. I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of relationships across, you know, wherever it is. Right. Um, especially with these units that are going through the training, you know, we have introduced in the past, we have introduced the SOTIF level units that are getting ready to be married up with their SOTIG units yeah. on, you know, say, Hey, these are, you know, meet and greet. Here's your, here's your guys. Right. These guys will be downrange with you, so go ahead and exchange you know Facebook profiles and phone numbers and all that. <laughs> right, right. You're going to be working together. Yeah. Um, which is important. Sure. You know, you know and there's certain units that always you know habitually work together, so they have that relationship. But there's a lot of units out there in the soft community that don't. Mm-hmm. Um, and even if it's like you're exposing them to that entity, it may not be the exact people, but you're like they are. Um, hopefully it is like you said they exchange numbers and stuff but it's um, but even if you're talking to uh like a group at least you know what to expect when you get down range it may not be the same people but it's the same entity the same kind of capabilities yeah yeah okay it's 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 great it's and there's practicing a lot of the tactics that they'll they'll see down sure. range that, that are required by you know the roes that are there yeah because the days of close air support in its traditional sense are gone yeah it's it's now a new flavor of air interdiction right ai not artificial intelligence it's sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. it's like and then we have an ato it's not an air tasking order it's a authority to operate right, right yeah <laughs> alpha alphabet acronym soup here yeah, really know? well that's awesome man that's that, that seems really needed necessary training event for sure yeah, and I know that we've uh, our organization because I think we have cracked the code on a lot of uh, the jointness, or it was mostly within the soft community because we're free chicken for any of the soft uh, units that are out there. Right. We work for USOCOM. USOCOM's not paying or charging people to come through the training. Sure. The only cost is TDY if you come to us in house. Mm-hmm. That's your own TDY cost. But if you don't want to go anywhere, we can do everything. You know, on the zipper nets and whatnot, we can sure. push everything through there. And you can sit in your own jock in your own unit and yep. just dial in and pull everything up, and then we can walk through everything. You know, That's this awesome. we're we're doing it every week. It's our calendar is so full; it's not even funny. <laughs> it's and it's getting. I mean, as more people find out about it, it's 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 ridiculous because it's getting more congested. But that's how it's, you can tell you got a good program going when when soft units are you know lining up around the block to be there you know what i mean that's how you know you got something going on because if it sucked the word would get out and nobody would want to go down there but it must be some valuable training for these guys to you know be fighting each other to get in so yeah good. do you remember uh greg funk i don't think so he was a um he was a warrant at a uh, regiment I, I think he was at third battalion as well, but he was, he was up at regiment. I know that. And then he retired, um, but he's uh, working on a, another contract and we've been working with him a lot. And uh, there's a couple of the mag guys on another contract. They're working with uh, first special forces command. Uh, it was Woody, but Woody's doing something else now. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember the other guys that are uh, Wags uh, is one of the guys. He's a former uh, Ranger guy. 
that's working with the first special forces command uh contract so they i guess the each command has hired their own contractors for instructors and trainers oh, okay to help them out in the you know hey this is how things are forming or formulating if you will yeah um and just keeping them i guess in tune with the latest and greatest when it comes to the tactics and tra- you know the training level sure. piece of things but those are those are some of the guys that are out there that you know they're doing amazing things they are uh these it, I mean, we're all you know a bunch of dirty contractors, but you know we still have a, a stake in this this grander scheme of things when it comes to making sure that you know I at least I personally feel oh for way. sure hundred you know, percent it I may not have gone to basic training or any kind of advanced training with any of these guys that are going through, but you know I don't want to I still don't want to see any more American lives lost to whatever when we could have knocked it out in this training piece, you know right scoped and molded their minds into a new way of doing things uh, that could save lives, you know, tighten the kill chain or tighten the reactionary rescue chain, if you sure. will, because that's, that's another piece to it. But we don't own the rescue piece, but, you know, that's still... That's still part of that whole system. Yeah. Yeah. Part of their responsibilities, you know, it's not just all killing. It's, you know, yeah. you might have to rescue or you might, you know, like you said, a Neo portion, you know, some Neo thing might come up, so... Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's whatever they have that, you know, whatever's relevant to their tasking, you know, for them to deploy, you know, whatever it is that they're supporting. Yeah. You know, I mean, you and brought the, up a good point. I mean, Lisco is, there's a lot more moving pieces to Lisco than there is like say coin or something, you know I mean? You're, oh yeah. You know, so. I mean, there's, there's so much that's unknown, you know, we don't know what we don't know. Sure. I, it, it sounds kind of weird, but we don't. Well, you'd have to just take every single uh, lesson learned from every major conflict, and that's what you could expect. You know, like everything that ever happened can happen in this Lisco environment. So, you should yeah, be ready. Yeah, and pro- and and even more than we're, like you said that we haven't even imagined. I'm sure. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Yeah, uh, it's it's crazy. It's just going to keep on building its own thing, and then I, I, you know, I keep on talking to my kids. I'm like, you know, I want to retire here in 10 years. And I'm like, dad, you're retired. I'm like, no, I want to retire. retire. <laughs> right, yeah. It's like, but I'm still maintaining a relevancy within, you know, the grander scheme of things when it comes to the military. Yeah. But I will need to, I will need to let go and let somebody else do this. Cause I mean, we all had to at some point, right. you know, or maybe there's people that are still in that have done these podcasts, you know, they will at some point, you know, mm-hmm. they'll have to, tra- they will have to transition from their uniform into, you know, whatever they want to do in civilian life, like you and I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm going to, even in the civilian life, I'm going to have to transition from this, you know, and let somebody else pick up the reins and I'm going to kick back and do whatever it is that I'm going to do. You yeah. Know, and you should or combing in the beach or whatever it is. Sure. I mean, yeah, you should, everybody should, everybody, should. everybody deserves that, that rest, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, can't be, can't be all go. No. <laughs> no, no, it can't be all go. Right. Well, th- this, this has been great, man. This has been really good catching up with you and hearing all this stuff. Like I always, I, I say this a lot and it's probably getting boring to people, but it's cool to talk to guys that I was stationed with and hear new stories like you know, like stuff that I didn't hear before. So I, I can't thank you enough for coming on here. I really appreciate it. It's cool to hear about your gunship stuff and your U-28 stuff and everything else. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, it was great to see you again. Yeah, same. Uh, it's been too long, um, and I've, like I've said in a lot of text messages with the guys that live down here in the Panhandle area, that you know, the gatherings, most of the gatherings that I've been to with people is because you know we lost somebody. Right. You know, I, I want to see more gatherings where hey, let's just get together, let's all crack open a beer, and you know, this is this is great. I remember the last social function that I went to was over at uh, Schleich's house. Yeah. And he had a bunch of people over there and it was just so amazing to see all these people. Yeah. Uh, Tommy showed up and it was like one of, that was one of the first times that I've seen Tommy in a long time. Um, and I've seen him a couple of times since. Yeah. Uh, well, there's just, so many of you, so what? many of you guys live down in Herbie. I mean, it's like crazy how many yeah. people are living down there. So it's like 17 yeah. South, they call it. You know? <laughs> yeah, it is. It really <laughs> is. Like uh, I'm in contact with uh, Matt Green yeah. quite a bit. Uh, he lives not too far away from me. And I know that there's where I live, there's quite a few guys that are still in that live in the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, but 
uh, there's other people that live, just live in the general area that I'm still in contact with. And it's, it's amazing. Like I've, I've built these relationships and then, you know, I thought that, you know, it was just for a, a brief moment, but no, it's been a lifetime, Yeah, you know, cause it's like, I may not cross paths with a lot of these people on an everyday basis, but you know, we still keep up with each other. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You know, like Dre Vansley, like him mm-hmm. and I, we, we talk uh, quite a bit, not as much as we probably should or would like to. Um, but funny enough, he and his wife and their, their family, they're like really close tight with my little sister and her family. Really? Who they have moved my, my baby sister. She moved down here. They're not in the military at all. Her, huh. her husband and their kids, no military affiliation whatsoever. She's a nurse and he's an, uh, my brother-in-law, Nate, he's a, uh, an electrician in a local company here, but they're like really close with the Vansley's really close. How about it's, that? It's awesome. So it's, 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 it's a family. Yeah, it is. When you share like the experiences that we had at the, at a place like the 17th and we're not, obviously we're not exclusive. I mean, there's other, everybody, you know, all the other yeah. units have this kind of thing being, whether it be the tech B community or the 17th or whatever it is, you know, you share those, those intense experiences and it's, it's not something you can just blow off. You feel this bond. And with these guys and with, you know, you and I share this bond and we all share the bond and it's just something you don't let go, you know, just seems like it's always there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it, it just, it doesn't go away. Right. You know, I feel, I feel like I'm a better person for it though. Oh, for sure. I, I wouldn't have traded my time there for anything or nope. my, even my military time. I, like I always tell people, I had a, I had a blast in the military. I had a, a lot of guys want, like, I think. Nah, I don't want to get to it. Some guys don't feel that way. I felt I felt that way. I felt like it was a good experience and I had fun and yeah, I wouldn't have traded it for anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Would not have traded a thing. <laughs> All right, man. Again, good seeing you. Thanks again for coming yeah, on. I, I can't thank you enough. It was like I said, it was good catching up and uh and uh keep in touch. Yeah, and I'll talk to you yeah, later. Absolutely. All right, man. Take care. Thank you.